and uh, now we can start the panel number one. So I'll call uh, on the stage uh, uh, the invited guests. Uh, um, we have uh, uh, Bruce, then we have Bart Prenil. And well, while, while they're coming, I will introduce them briefly. So Bart Prenil is uh, one of the most recognized uh, cryptologists in, uh, in Europe, uh, probably the most recognized. And uh, Richard Stallman is uh, president of the Free Software Foundation and um, uh, inventor, uh, no, a founder of, of the free software movement. And uh, now the software he, he started, an operating system is uh, running on most of uh, uh, mobile and server devices of the world under the name, uh, a name in, an in, under an incomplete name. So. And, and Andreas Wild, you've seen before, we have Bjorn Rup, which is a uh, uh, CEO of JSMK Cryptophone, which is uh, a leading uh, uh, cryptophone maker from Germany, which is uh, uh, for many years the only company whose software layer has been publicly verifiable, although not free software. And that's been a big change in the market, at least giving open verifiability without NDA, which makes a big difference. They have, of course, been uh, possibly having a hard time you know, still uh, managing the lower layers, but they're uh, uh, pretty much on the transparency sector um, up up there. Uh, then we have Jovan Golic that we had presented, and we have Michael Sieber, which spoke, and Mel and Pierre Mel, Mel who is also invited. And uh, uh, please get this chair, and I'll get another one. Okay, please. I think we have enough chairs. Yes. Okay. So, Jovan. Um, okay, we have a uh, quite a big panel. I think uh, they don't get uh, bigger than this. I don't know the the um, the uh, theme was of interest, uh, uh, and so many wanted to intervene. So, I I will invite. Um, you uh, know, very short uh, interventions. You uh, know, about three, four minutes, kind of a flash on on the um, on the theme. And uh, I will keep on on on, uh, on the screen the the, the theme you know, that we're discussing. And uh, so I'll, I'll probably start in the order in which we're seated. Um, or um, or maybe uh, Michael, you wanna you want to, do you want to start? Um, okay, I, gu I guess that we could have. Uh, um, he starts. I, I think that Bart uh, could be a good uh, choice to frame uh, this uh, discussion, as it's been uh, dealing more uh, deeply on uh, the overall picture of these issues. How many Bart. Can you get? Well, I, I would say uh, about. Oh yeah, there you go. So I, I would say three to five minutes, and then uh, we have about uh, an hour, uh, an hour for the panel. Thank you, Rupo, and good morning. Um, so I just want to say a few things. Uh, I think Bruce gave a very good introduction to what we need. And what we need is trust. And I think what we lack in Europe, actually, is trust. I think I'm actually quite surprised as an academic that after the Snowden revelations, there was not more response from Europe. And of course, Europe is never fast. We know that already. It takes always a long time. But also, we don't seem to trust each other as nations. I mean, what we also saw in the Snowden documents, of course, is that nations are spying on each other. They've always been doing this, but now they're also hacking each other. But the European nations don't trust each other. And even very simple things are difficult. To give you one example, and I don't think, I mean, I'm a cryptographer, I come up with cryptography, I don't think it's the most important thing. And it's a simple thing we need to agree on. And so, first observation is, some of the most important cryptographic standards were developed in Europe, but selected by NIST. And Europe had no voice there. In fact, Great job from the Belgians, but in the end, the Americans decided which one would win. And several European nations have lists of recommended cryptographic algorithms. It's just simple advice to banks, insurance companies, hospitals, how many key bits you should use and which cipher you should use. It's just basic standard advice. It's all national. There is no European advice. So 
11 years ago, in Network of Excellence, we decided to produce such a European document that would tell banks and governments and insurance companies and, and so on what the recommendations were. And every year we updated it. Our Network of Excellence stopped in 2013, and then ENISA took over this document and funded some people to produce this document, which is widely used, to actually give advice. You know what happened this year? Some nations asked ENISA to unpublish this document, to unpublish a document saying how many qubits you should use. And in fact, this document has been removed from their work program. The good news is I have a new equip project, so I can produce, academics will produce a new list, but this is the basic stuff. We can't even in Europe allow academics to make basic recommendations on the what you should use as crypto. So if you're in this level of distrust among nations, how can you build cyber secure, cyber secure world? I find this very concerning. We have to first solve the trust issue. If we don't have basic trust, they're gonna be attacking each other all the time and they're gonna be also attacked by all the other nations. I was very pleased because in my group we do software and hardware research and we always keep saying it's not only software, it's not only hardware, you have to integrate it. And we also hear about open software, and we'll hear more about this later, but I didn't hear about open hardware. And in fact, free software, excuse me, maybe I made a big mistake, but I at least. <laughs> the question is, why don't we make also our hardware open? And in fact, you see that the big cloud companies, what they're doing is switch for economic reasons to open hardware because they want to play their suppliers against each other. But there is no motivation for security or trust or, or a better society to actually insist on open hardware. I'm not saying everything should be made public or available, but at least some core components we should be able to also openly inspect. And the final point I want to make um, is the fact that you saw the quote by Bruce, in fact that the current event is funded by surveillance, um, advertising driven business model, profiling driven business model. So this is how money is being made. So if we want to change this, we have to weigh the, cha the economics. If we're just gonna change technology, it's not gonna happen. We can make beautiful solutions, but if we don't change the business model, it's not gonna change anything. So I think we need new architectures, but those architectures will not, not happen unless we change regulation. And one very naive idea would be that, you know, you collect bytes of information, most of us are being breached, large, large corporations are being breached regularly. What if you know you pay one euro per byte that's breached? Maybe companies would stop actually collecting all this information. Of course, it's maybe naive, I'm not a lawyer, it's very naive view of an academic, but I think if we don't start from the regulation, we will not be able to actually change technology. I'll leave it there, thank you. Mm. Um, okay, great. Um, as far as order, I will follow uh, the order uh, as it's written on the paper. So the next in line is uh, Richard. Richard is your, your next uh, to talk and uh, take on uh, the challenge. Okay, first I'll respond to a few points that have been made. One thing is I advocate free software, free as in freedom, logiciel libre, vraie software. Uh, the point is the user's freedom, the software should respect user's freedom, the user should be in the ones who control what the program does, not somebody else, the owner. And you can do this for hardware designs too. Hardware as such can't be libre in this sense because once it's made as hardware, you can't change it, nobody can change it. But the hardware design is a work that can be edited and copied just like a program. So I think free hardware designs is a good thing. For more information, see gnu.org slash philosophy slash free hardware designs.html. Now, since you mentioned a great hero, Edward Snowden, there's something that it's my duty to say. Three cheers for Edward Snowden. Hip, hip, hooray. Hip, hip, hooray. Hip, hip, hooray. We need to say this because officials in the US are still trying to demonize him they call him a criminal when they, in fact, are the criminals. And they accuse him of violating his oath. He's the only one in that whole apparatus that kept his oath to defend the US Constitution from all enemies, foreign or domestic. 
So we have to keep spreading the idea, the point that we admire him because he stood up for the people against dangerous governments. Of course, we know that other governments snoop on people as well. And in fact, it's in the US that there's been the most resistance to this. <coughs> it's shameful the way a wave of governments around the world have legislated that they can snoop on anybody in any way at all and there are no checks anymore. But that's what's happening. They figured that they would act <coughs> first before the people got organized to say no. <clears throat> and of course, corporations do work with, with the governments. It all adds up to spying. <clears throat> so I'd like to question the phrase constitutionally meaningful levels of trustworthiness. And the reason is when I judge what systems I can trust, it has almost nothing to do with the Constitution of the US or whatever country it might be. That's not where the criteria for trustworthiness come from. They have something to do with what human rights we can legally claim. But of course, even if a Constitution doesn't defend your human rights, they're still your human rights. It's the Constitution that's at fault. But when we go away beyond human, oh, you know, further away from uh, right and wrong and legality and we go to trustworthiness, that has, om the judgment of that has almost nothing to do with any constitution. It's a question, it's a practical question, uh, not just technical but social of course, but still it's a practical question that we can judge without reference to a constitution as standard. Um, okay. Thanks, Richard. And Richard will have a full keynote after this panel. And next on is uh, Andreas Wald. Thank you. I'm going to take um, something very risky now because I'm going to speak a little bit about trust in front of an eminent specialist that gave us a wonderful, inspirational speech on it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I want to highlight an aspect of trust that uh, did not come in that very short, very brief description. Trust does not pre-exist and does not happen spontaneously. Trust is built up in a process normally. And um, some of the points that have been made here are basically uh, showing that we are still at the beginning or in the initial phases of building up trust maybe in a new environment in which we are finding ourselves, so in a new activity at a societal level and so forth. And therefore, there are not norms, there are not, this is a work in process. I'll give a brief example from my organization. We bring together member states, and we have at this point in time 24 member states participating, the European Commission and the private sector. It took about three years before we agreed among ourselves how to handle the, this extremely complicated beast in a halfway productive manner. Uh, it, it was not because we do now something differently. It took <coughs> that long <coughs> until everybody involved started trusting the others around the table and accepting that we go by similar norms and we don't harm each other, we don't attack the neighbors and, and so forth and so forth. So it took some time to get there. Some of the talks you, you or the points you made, for example, on European not being enough European. Europe is work in progress. Europe is the dream of a um, USA federalist from the initial phases, a very, very, very weak federal construct with limited uh, competencies and with limited resources. Uh, remember that the whole European budget is about 130 billion. If that is we put in perspective, Germany has for its administration almost 10 times as much, uh, France about eight times as much. So, so if you look at that, Europe as such will rank right before Denmark in terms of financial means. So Europe is a small federal institution that does not have all competencies. And the way a uh, European grow together, uh, I have to say it's uh, my observation. I was with the private sector, with an American company all my career until about six years ago when I became a bluster bureaucrat. <laughs> but uh, before I made that big jump, I realized that, uh, in fact, uh, Europe can only evolve from crisis to crisis. 
And that is a fundamental mechanism. Starts from the observation uh, that the subsidiarity principle that is very strongly anchored in the institutions says that you will solve a problem at the lowest level possible and you will move to the upper level only when you cannot find a solution. The only way to demonstrate that you cannot find a solution is you hit a snap, you have a crisis. That was the crisis of the euro that enabled them to transfer re, uh, competencies from the national banking institutions to the European Federal Bank uh, and so forth. So uh, it is the normal process. We can probably, if we get wiser, try to anticipate crisis and try to do something to prevent, prolong, and move them ahead. This is not unnatural. And I believe what we are here to discuss today is, can we be wise enough to preempt the occurrence of a major crisis? Now, if you look at Snowden uh, presentations and even uh, things that happen now in uh, conflicts around the world, and you see how cyber security and cyber attacks are used militarily and so on and so forth, uh, the question is, do we have to wait until we are really under threat or really suffer, or can we anticipate and prevent something of that nature? I believe that maybe if we become a little bit wiser, <coughs> and we can imagine along the lines, which I, I like very much indeed, and transparency, um, oversight, and accountability are wonderful things to go by. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so thanks for uh, Andreas. And now uh, we have Jovan Golic that uh, uh, possibly you know, could tell us if it is possible. No? I mean, whatever the constitutional meaningful means, I mean, it's just setting an arbitrary, very high target that would be meaningful for a user. If this is uh, doable, which most people don't think it's doable, and maybe how that could be. Oh, well, thanks. Uh, let me first start uh, with some basic uh, observation uh, related to trust. Uh, it would appear that, in fact, to me, that uh, trust has to do with the ability of humans to predict and then to ha have certain confidence that the things uh, will go on as predicted. So this gives us comparative advantage to other species. But it relates to physical world, uh, so uh, physical objects and system. Uh, in cyberspace, we are dealing with bits. And then uh, uh, to have trust, uh, in the way that the bits are dealt with by humans is uh, very difficult. And in fact, uh, I would say it's unrealistic. Uh, because, why? Because bits are easy to copy, first of all. So how can you trust that uh, unless you protect the bit? Uh, this is uh, why we need protection. This is why we need technology. So this is why in, in the action line we are pushing uh, towards trustworthy technologies. And then, so we have solutions, uh, we have algorithms, uh, then uh, lower down we have uh, software platforms, so we have hardware platforms. And in fact, in Europe, we have sufficient knowledge and expertise in all these areas. One of the problems is that Bart already mentioned, we are fragmented, and also other speakers before us. We are fragmented. We have a great expertise in hardware security in uh, countries like Germany, like France and others, but in fact, uh, and they all work on, uh, on standardization, but the processes are very slow there. So we need uh, to speed up the processes to have dedication and real intentions to improve things. I believe that they can do much better in terms of certification, first of all, and then also in terms of standardization to improve the current situation, which is not good in terms of, of cybersecurity. Thank you. Okay. so. Thanks to Jovan. Next online is uh, Bjorn Rup. Thank you. Um, since it's supposed to be an introductory statement, I'll keep it brief. Um, is it possible to achieve meaningful IT assurance? Yes. Why do I say this? Because I'm an optimist, otherwise I wouldn't have founded a company. Um, but uh, in order to achieve that, we have to make a few hard choices. Um, and that's often overlooked, even if all of us, even if everyone on this panel agrees on how these choices should be made. It doesn't mean that the rest of the population will necessarily agree um, or understand why these choices need to be made. And um, they involve things like higher costs for security, and uh, they involve inconvenience. Um, obviously, if you want a super secure uh, environment, then you somehow need to detach it from an unsecure general purpose computing environment that uh, was developed without uh, rules in mind that uh, put security first. And uh, just to round this 
of um, just think of the aviation industry, which has an excellent uh, record in maintaining s high safety levels, but uh, the cost that you pay for that is pretty high. Um, first of all, innovation is only, well, incremental at best. And uh, of course, uh, the cost is considerable. So um, are we willing to trade, let's say for instance, not getting the very latest features uh, on a daily basis for more stable, more well-founded, um, more robust and more secure system. It's, these are the hard choices that we need to make, I believe. Great. Uh, thanks to Bjorn for this very uh, lucid uh, contribution. Um, next on line, Michael Sieber from the European Defense Agency. Okay, thank you. So from, an I from a defense point of view, I would say uh, yes, we do want to have affordable, definitely, and user-friendly end-to-end IT services. Um, but that's full stop. So for that, everything applies. What I said that, uh, first of all, we will not be able to fund the developments our own. We will have to rely on what is going on in the civil sector, in the industrial sector. And uh, if it's not Europe, we have to be rely on Chinese or on US American uh, devices, as we partially, at least concerning NATO alliance, do already know. But as a European citizen, I would like to highlight uh, maybe the frame of actors that we have in this whole game. Um, it's first of all, uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's government and administration, it's industry, and it's the user, the end user itself. So when we talked about trust, I mean, constitutional meaning full level of user trustworthiness, if I lower it enough, then everybody will be happy. So the question is, are our levels possibly too high. If we look at users today, they'd probably be very low. And so I come back to the point I mentioned with responsibility. And uh, I also quote Chancellor Merkel when she said, the internet is uncharted land. Now she's a physicist, so she probably knew, has known about the internet for a long time, but for politicians it probably is uncharted land because there's a high level of uncertainty about the complexity, about many other things. Um, so how should they take responsibility if they don't know the whole scope? So it will very much depend on the consultancy that they receive, on one hand from academia, but I guess as we've observed in the past, I very much share the point with from crisis to crisis, and my goal would be to get ahead of the curve also in this, in this domain. As we've observed in the past is that they like to react and react on pressure that they get. And the pressure usually comes out of economy and out of the market. And this is where we have to, as, as consultants that we all are because we tackle the problem, that we have to build up this pressure. And I believe as a citizen that this can come only through industry. And therefore, there should be some, some ethics. Of course, the question in the future will be, will the Volkswagen do the IT or will IT do well, actually build the cars like Google is trying to. This is another revolutionary move that we have ahead of us. And uh, the question then will be uh, where, where we will we have to tackle the ethics, actually, of the big industry. But in a nutshell, I think politicians would be willing to do something in improving the trust building, improving conditions for trust and trustworthiness. But they need to have some pressure, some incentive, and also some good consultancy. And this comes from the other stakeholders. Um, thanks to Michael. Next online is um, Mel. Yeah, I believe so. <laughs> uh, well, apparently Apple is now uh, building cars as well. So, uh, uh, and apparently, uh, like half of people will already buy them without even knowing uh, what the car is going to be. Uh, actually, uh, um, the element that I wanted to focus on uh, in what we were uh, what we were doing, uh, what we were discussing here, is looking at uh, user friendliness, because uh, uh, I think that's uh, often one of the aspects that we're uh, we're overlooking, and it's one of the aspects that uh, that I've been trying to look at uh, a lot in in the research that I've been doing. So uh, mainly the fact that uh, it's one of the aspects that usually get lost if we look at uh, implementing. Uh, more secure uh, ways uh, uh, to to uh, make the software and things like that. Um, so it, it means uh, working more towards putting users in the in the um, 
driver seat, so that would requires, I think, some element of, of regulation in, uh, in making the user uh, central in, uh, <coughs> in declaring uh, what, they, what they want and what, uh, uh, what they want to uh, reveal and what they, uh, what they keep in, uh, in, in stock for themselves. Um, and, it and it requires uh, a lot of effort as well on the part of industry in, uh, uh, in developing more, uh, more ways uh, to put this user in the, in the driver's seat. And so um, um, I think a lot of more effort needs to go into that. And I think it, it goes beyond just, um, uh, beyond just uh, noticing here that that we need to have more instruments in place. We need to think more about how we can actually make things work that are user friendly. Um, thanks, Dumel. Last in line for this first round is uh, Pierre Chastanet. From okay, Michigan. thank you very much. Uh, I think I would like to build on what Mel just said uh, on uh, the fact that uh, probably we're forgetting too much about one essential element in cybersecurity, that is the people, that is, this is the user. Um, I mean, we far too uh, often look at cybersecurity as a technological challenge, uh, as a technological uh, problem, whereas mostly uh, it's a societal uh, challenge. Um, in this respect, we have to look at how we can mainstream uh, cybersecurity. Uh, very often, uh, uh, we look at cybersecurity from uh, there's this famous tri triangle where you, you look at um, uh, the technology, the processes, and the, and the people. So a lot of emphasis is being put on technological development. Um, through a number of developments, uh, more and more emphasis is being put on processes, especially uh, cybersecurity risk management. That's one of the... Uh, thing we're trying to address through the NIS directive uh, uh, with uh, critical operators uh, in Europe that will have a mandate to put in place best practices in uh, cybersecurity risk management uh, for their uh, operation. That's an essential element. But there is also this third element, which is the people, the people. Um, usability of technological solution is absolutely essential. We have to look at mechanism to try to mainstream the usage of cybersecurity and privacy uh, solutions. Uh, we have to look at practical tools that people, that the average citizen, that the average SME can implement in an easy manner to use in their everyday life. Um, most of the users are non-technological people and we have to facilitate uh, their usage of, uh, of these technologies. Uh. Um, uh, ENISA, uh, the European uh, Network and Information Security Agency, uh, produced a report recently about uh, security incidents in the, in the telecom uh, sector. Uh, uh, and they looked at uh, a broad variety of incidents that occurred in, in this sector. And actually, very few are actually coming from cyber attacks. Uh, a lo most of the incidents are occurring because of human errors. So is administrator that are wrongly configuring software? Is people that are doing web administrator right that are installing the wrong app or doing the wrong uh, uh, installation that eventually lead to either vulnerabilities or uh, systems getting down? So really a lot of emphasis need to be put uh, on, um, uh, on the people again across the, the value chain. So upstream among the uh, IT administrators, um, uh, IT um, uh, developers, software developers. There's a lot of uh, emphasis to be uh, to be put uh, on the people that are designing and engineering these systems to make them eventually user-friendly and accessible uh, for the for the ultimate user.